Hello. Hi. How are you feeling? Good. Um, yeah, I I I got up really early. I'm always fucking around with these peacocks. So <laughs> <laughs> the peacocks, the peacocks and the raccoons are taking over my life. Well, where are you at right now? I'm in Orlando. I live in Orlando. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. You like it? Oh yeah, I I really come to enjoy it. Like I'm from South Carolina, but I'd never want to live there again. I just can't. Yeah. I I got trapped here, mm. and since I've been trapped here, I just had come to the point where I started to live here instead of just be here. And um, I can't imagine any place else. I like that. Good for you. Yeah. I, I yeah I think uh there's a lot going on here there's always some kind of event or festival there's spiritual stuff there's motorcycle stuff there's like just so many kinds of people doing stuff that if you really wanted to you could just throw yourself out there and uh go meet people and do stuff and uh the beaches are everywhere and um you're you're up you're up north well no I Well, it depends on kind of what you call the North, right? But um, I'm in North Carolina. Okay, that's why you get to go to all those festivals up there. They seem to be pretty happening too. I mean, yeah, North Carolina is pretty cool. It's a, uh, it's got a lot of good combinations of lots of different things. I like it. Yeah, and plus a lot of um, there's the energy lines there too. Do you feel like um, like the ones in Asheville are still legit? Because I, I'm hearing that they moved. So I'm guessing a lot of people surrounded themselves in that, that area and built a lot of stuff. But how do you, what do you think? Well, well, first of all, where did you hear that uh, ley lines move? Well, maybe not that ley lines move, but portals do. Like there was one um, down near Tampa. And uh, I guess that's where Ashiana Dean Days and she talks about it a lot like the, okay. the um some stargate that's what she was talking about a stargate but some people said that the stargates move i just kind of assume that well say there's a portal in a place called casadega right up here in orlando and it's right outside of orange city the the people have built everything there and they have the tarot readings and they do a lot of stuff. They got like the fairy gardens, but I've seen a lot of people complain that the people that live there aren't necessarily legit. You know what I mean? Like they're not good at their readings at all, mm -hmm. even though they kind of gravitated to that place and kind of blocked everybody else, right? Blocked everybody else out by, by building their businesses there. And, um, I guess that's what happens when egos kind of get involved in right <laughs> yeah well i just wondered you know what what it was like up there in north carolina i've gone up there just just drove up there just to go mining before ah i actually live pretty close to a gold mine actually yeah um, and i live in a relatively small town and i actually know the guy who owns the place and um, wow. i've yet to go out there but i love these small town connections so for me it's very it's it's much more about grounding and where i live right now i feel very grounded very rooted and i've sort of placed myself or at least The universe has assisted the placement of um, me being here in this moment in time. And I never lived in a small town before. Um, it's always, you know, medium to larger cities. So I love every bit of this. I feel almost like 
you know, my, the Chronicle series is kind of coming to life. It's the oddest, oddest thing. I'm just sort of watching all these relationships blossom and I'm actually going to be interviewed by the, the town newspaper on, I think it's um, a few days from now. Um, <laughs> I did a little book signing at the library. So I know the director and, you know, it's just these, these cute little relationships I have. Like I know the, the magistrate and I know the, you know, the, the clown, the, the um, town clerk and everything. It's just really cute. It's like your version of the resident alien. That, or also even Mayberry, a little Mayberry. Yeah. Because Lord knows when I don't clean up my pine straw in time, the neighbors kind of come over and they give me a little fruit pie and they're like, would you like some help with your pine straw? I'm like, sure. Wow, they're like, really serious. <laughs> but it's just cute. I mean, they do it so sweetly. I, um, you know, I grew up in the Southeast and I had kind of a perspective of what the Southeast was back then. I think there was more of a prevalence back then of kind of, I don't know, it all depends on one's own growth, for instance, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I had Northern parents, grew up in the Southeast. I had that sort of dichotomy going on. I couldn't wait to get out of the South. I mean, I went right up to New York when I was, I think, 21 or two. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did New York for like a decade. And then I did San Francisco and Sacramento for about a decade. And I'm just happy as a clam out here. So I just wanted to preface, this is actually the first interview or, or conversation I'm kind of having over, over the interwebs after my dog passed. So it's like- Yes, a the dog, and then you got divorced. Well, I'm kind of working. It's not quite getting divorced. It's starting the process of divorce. Yeah. Um, it's, it's honestly, it's all par for the course. Like my husband and I, we love each other so much, but you know, he wants to stay in California. I want to stay over here. That's a big, you know, challenge right there. And also too, we've grown so differently, you know, um, and, and when there is an impasse that is just, I mean, it's just, there's lots of things I could say, but I'll simply say that um, we love each other tremendously and we will continue to support each other. But I feel very called to um, to continue my path out here. And on a happy note, uh, I just got hired to be a music teacher. Oh, you really did get the job. Yes, hired um, to be a music teacher, pretty close by, but maybe 20 minute drive. And it's a cute little school. And it's like, honey, it's so pic picturesque. When I went over there, oh my God. And the kids are so well behaved, like, I mean, living in San Francisco and having, yeah, teaching children, you know, in, in public school system and, and having my own clients and stuff, I, and in New York City, I was like, children who listen and who are like, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, I'm like, I will take that. It's actually Yeah, really you've entered into a, wow, it, it sounds amazing. It really is. Like, this is the thing that we hope for, and we're like, we're going to manifest, but it's like, Really? No, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially with the neighbors like that. That's really cool that you can find peace like that in a small town because most people are, I guess that's the image that they try to put portray is I got to get out of this small town mm. instead of get back into it. But, you know, I mean, mm. here we are. We grew up with people making fun of kids that were homeschooled. And now it's like, get your kids to freak out of school. Isn't you it? Know? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting this uh yeah. this thing. This I thing remember happening. When I, I remember when I couldn't even wait to get out of even Raleigh. I lived in Raleigh, which was a kind of medium sized town, um, a city. And I've seen it grow over the decades. And honey, it is like almost unrecognizable right now. But I just remember that longing for my soul to get out there and see the world and Lord knows you know, step on all the landmines and, uh, you know, be blown to, to bits a few times. But I mean, that's just what I was called to do. So now I'm just bringing that wisdom over here. And I'm just so thankful to be in a place that really appreciates my, my gifts and my skills. I'll be honest with you. It's very weird to do the things that we do and to find a place <laughs> as stereotypically Mayberry that I live um, that welcomes me for me i mean i've gotten basically zero negative feedback and if there was any it doesn't really bother me that's the thing like i don't really care um right you I mean, got enough positive relationships that those ones don't matter 
And also too, I don't look for other people to define who I am. I really don't. I understand that's kind of a relatively natural human kind of condition. But you know, once you've died a few times <laughs> in one lifetime, it's just like, you don't give a shit really. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. As you said, give a shit. I just envisioned like this poop in your hand and just be like, here, <laughs> here's a donut <laughs> or a cupcake. All right. You know what? You know, I had already, it's already on record, even though we're not. That's okay. On thing, but I figured this will be, if you, if you join on Facebook, you got to still watch it because you're not going to see the good stuff where we're talking ahead of time. See, are we on Facebook live or just being recorded? No, we're just on here. Okay. <laughs> you know what happens? Terry is joined. I was, I'm waiting. I was also waiting for my co-host Terry. Hmm. And so Terry has this terrible habit of starting the interview before the interview. And she asked like these amazing questions ahead of time. And I'm like, stop, no, <laughs> we got to press record because Terry's asking this question and, and we don't want to miss it. So we're already starting out recorded. We're doing the behind the scenes chat. There you go. <laughs> Terry, your can't, glasses look can't amazing. Can ask any questions? You can do whatever you want because it's already recorded. Oh, hi, Dan. <laughs> we're hi, getting Terry, really impromptu. You. Very yes. impromptu. And I got my nice I got my nice dress on for you, Dan. I it's like beautiful. that. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I have a red one. It doesn't fit the same. It, it's red and it's just like this, but it doesn't fit quite right. But this one. It looks nice. Bye -bye. Different, different hands cut it. Ooh. Ooh. Well, Terry, you look nice. I guess it was everybody's idea to get fancy. <laughs> And your hair looks fabulous. Terry's out there in Canada. Hi, Terry. I'm up in Winnipeg. Yeah. Okay, lovely. And it's very hot for us. It's very hot here today. I think it's um about uh supposed to be 37 Celsius. Okay. That's pretty hot. You look so banging. Perfect. I just I gotta say that because I'm just like, mm, it's looking a little spicy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> For for a woman of certain of a certain age, right? Yes, of a certain age. We're putting her back out here on these corners, Dan. <laughs> uh, not Mayberry. <laughs> not the Mayberry corners. Well, possibly. <laughs> he he was just talking because he's come from living in New Jersey, is where you originally lived, and then no, no, New York. Jersey? It was New York. New York. Oh, okay, I must have read it wrong. New York, and then to um. Was it North Carolina you went for treatment? Uh, good question. Yeah. So born in the Bronx, lived in Jersey for a hot minute, uh, then went to Raleigh where I received um, treatment. Yeah. For my uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia at the age of four, four to six. Okay. Yeah. And then from there, I stayed in North Carolina. Um, I mean, I, I honestly think that my education was pretty good. Um, of course, my 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 northeastern uh, cousins and stuff would disagree. They'd always be like, you know, those damn southerners don't know what they're doing, whatever. So, but it was it was good. I had a good time. I was free for the most part. I had some darn good memories of of school and education and, and whatnot. Then in my twenties, I was in New York City, and thirties in uh, San Francisco and Sacramento. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were we live streaming? Yeah, we're about to hit the button. I'm hitting the button. And I like when we bust in in the middle of conversations doing ridiculous <laughs> stuff. So I, I like being ridiculous. Okay. So, so I don't... have a ridiculous question then. So when uh, you were when you were four or six, when you went through this um, health crisis, do you did you have a near death experience? Did yes. you think, a part of it? Did yes. you have a walk in? So, do you think, oh, or that is what do you very think? Interesting question. Um, that's a very interesting question because I've you're the first person to ask this, and you know what, Eric, you're right. Terry asks good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't, I, I don't want to say something that I'm not completely certain about, but I will say that I feel as though just genetically, like I was born to sort of um, have the experiences that I had. Um, I've always kind of had a team around me but they were made more apparent when I was in the hospital uh, because I definitely did 
I don't say suffer like I was a victim, but I was experimented on a lot because in the 80s, they didn't have a lot of information about childhood cancer and stuff. So they threw everything in the kitchen sink at me. I um, do my best not to recall like not to recall some of these but um they would they would create these contraptions to like gather blood from me and it was like very traumatic it was scary scary stuff and i was very young um yeah so i've had i've had lots of different operations and stuff but i remember when i was five years old being in the hospital and um what i what i didn't understand at the time was was that it was an out of body thing but my but i had clinically my heart had stopped. So um, I was out of my body at one point and I was watching what I knew was my body. But again, I was very young. I was like five and I was watching and <laughs> there was a very, 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 very tall, I guess you could say like masculine being to my right. And there was a bit of a playful energy, but still kind of a, a relatively observational energy to the whole thing. And so at that point, um, I kind of got the message of, do you want, um, do you want to, you, do you want to leave? Do you want to stay? Look at what you would miss if you didn't. Um, and I sort of had some, I guess you'd call it telepathic communication with this being. And I thought this was a dream, but unfortunately it was, it stuck with me for, it still sticks with me. And it took me actually going through my doctoral program to have, um, kind of an understanding of what near-death experiences are and out-of-body experiences for me to recognize what that was. But long story short, when I, I guess when my soul or my, 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 my carnal existence agreed, I don't have to explain it, energetic frequency agreed to step back in, um, my next conscious memory was being in the hospital bed and putting together a puzzle. So I was like literally in the process of putting together a puzzle. So I have heard some stories about walk-ins and there are some similarities there. I'm not gonna preclude anything, but I will just simply say, I don't have too much information about that. I only know what I knew. And because I was so young, I'm trying not to put too much of, a, um, of an intellectual spin on something that I don't have firm answers on, yeah. My my understanding from walk-ins, and I don't know whether you can talk on this, is that um, there's sort of an agreement at that soul level. So the consciousness that was there is is in congruence with the one that's walked in, but it's the walk-in actually comes from that soul level. So it's still my understanding is that it's still a part of your soul group it's just that it may be a different aspect of the soul group that's come in does that resonate at all with you or that is, that is all very interesting and i've also heard a little bit too of sometimes it's actually either a different um soul frequency altogether that comes in all i can say is is that i even from a very very young age i was very intuitive i was very odd kind of feeling i was sort of that and i'll i'll say this because my my parents would agree that i was like an angelic kid when i was young very much so i just um i i knew that i was going to be experiencing a lot of hardship which i did after all of that uh, i just soaked up as much as I could. Now, I'll say one thing, and I believe this was potentially after, I can't quite remember, because I think I was like three or so. Ah, anyways, I think this was after the cancer treatment. I remember um, going down a water slide, and I think I had just, like I had either had my Broviac catheter out or there was still the scar that I remember the sensation of. And I remember um, sliding down a water slide, but also to communicating with like invisible beings, like always feeling like very free, like, oh, they're going to protect me. Well, I went down this slide by myself. Now, you know, this was in the 80s. So, you know, just got over not wearing seatbelts in the 70s and stuff. So it wasn't as as it is now. So I'm, I'm, I'm about to go down the slide. And just when I go down the slide, the, <laughs> I got a very strong message of, um, you're going to have to take a very large breath. And I was just like, okay. So I took a very large breath just before I hit the water. Now, 
I was a small child. I didn't know what was happening, but I got caught in the undercurrent of the water where the slide was. And, and I'm telling you right now, I knew that if, if someone didn't save me, that I was going to die. Okay. So this would have been a second time dying. Right. Um, but someone told me to put my hand up. Now, remember, I'm a small kid. I'm literally in the water. I don't know what end is up. And they said, put your hand up. So I put my hand up. My body still did not stop um, spinning. But thank God that someone found me. And it was actually my dad. And this was a big thing because um, there are very rare times that my um, bio family and I have you know, relative good experiences because it was, it was quite arduous. There was a lot of um, challenges. Um, I had an older brother that was, you know, big criminal, but, um, uh, thank God my dad saved me because he even said himself that he was sun tanning. He, he just, he said he got the urge to get up and see, see where I was. And he just saw a hand and he thought, Hey, I better save that kid. So thank God he did, because I remember being pulled out of that water and I knew for certain that I would have died. Um, I don't know if that, I, I don't think I, I went on a tangent there, but long story short, um, I'm simply saying that, um, I don't know if it's a walk-in experience or not, but I have heard different different um, testimonies from people, but I will say that um, whatever the agreement was, I knew that I was supposed to um, be a, a presence um, to, to, uh, soak up as much knowledge as I could to then transfer that knowledge later. And I knew this at like a really young age. So I would be talking with, I mean, Erica feels me when I'd be talking with like older adults, having like older adult kind of wise, sagacious conversations when I was like a little kid. And that was just very odd and, and, and rare, but, um, all I can say is, is that I'm very happy that I wrote my, my memoir, um, Waiting for Life. Uh, very, very funny, poignant, kind of sad, all the, all the wonderful things. Oh, you stop with that. Good plug, Erica. <laughs> I, I want to say something because all the feelings that sunk into yeah. my chest, I've almost drowned as a small child like you did. And I think this is why Perry just does these things, right? That um and my I was just talking to my sister the other day because my favorite word was the undertow. The undertow, beware of the undertow. And I used to say that a lot. But um what yeah. year were you born? I want to ask first. Sure, born if you don't mind. I was I'll give you mine. Okay. I was born in 74. Oh, really? Wow, yeah. you're good, sis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to know what I, I was born? Oh, uh, you stop it, Terry. <laughs> It'll blow your skirt up. Woo, I was born in fifty. I was born in fifty-four. Amazing. Yeah, we're exactly twenty years, and we're both Libras too. Wow. Well, I got the Gemini, so this is fun. We are lots of we're all air. Airy conversations. Yeah. <laughs> so what I was thinking when you were just sitting there talking about like your beginning of your childhood is that like you, it's like you came in with a notepad. Mm. And you're just like, okay, check. Okay, check. Now, why do you do this? How do you do mm. this? What do you think? Like, because I feel like the same. Yeah. And then this thing of drowning, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, there's things that I don't want to remember. And I have to be told. And I'm wondering with the drowning is something is your full memory or is that something that you had to be reminded of or is it you no. had full recollection of observation no. so this is the interesting thing i <laughs> um i don't know how or why but i remember like a lot of my life yeah so much so that um good luck in an argument because i'll remember exactly what you say how you say it <laughs> and I, I don't i'm a little bit of a joke but I understand, you know, the challenges of, you know, especially my mother, who I'm sure she just she just wanted a bit of an easy life. But unfortunately, I was like, no, no, we need to, we need to solve this, you know. <laughs> I don't understand. Like, yeah, <laughs> just a little person looking up like, I don't understand. 
<laughs> exactly. Listen, Linda, listen, so, listen, oh, listen, you, Linda. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, because um, my ch in my childhood, one of the things I realized is that it wasn't until years later that people don't think like I used to think. And I had, like you said, I would have conversations in my head. I would have memories. And I just assumed, you know, when I was a small kid, I just knew so much. And I assumed that people knew oh. the same thing as I did. And it wasn't until later on, it's just like, damn, people don't think like I do. I'm, I'm really... I'm really not normal <laughs> in that sense. And it was it was hard to get to the point of realizing that people don't think like this. Yeah. And so and it was it was like, ew. <laughs> it was a, a hard realization in a way. I completely understand that. And, you know, kind of getting back to what we were uh, talking about, me and Erica, when I first came on, you know, sort of the challenge with, you know, marriage and, and everything. I, I remember in, 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 in conversation with my husband, um, I would just be like, Brian, listen, I know that most people don't think like me. I know that, but please, I can't be anything other than me in this moment. Like, please understand that, um, you know, I can see where these, where this argument is leading and where, where if we take this path is leading. And I just, I wish that we could find a way to kind of maybe compromise or steer the you ship and such a nice way to say the same thing that I, I truly this saying. was in this was in argumentation I would be speaking like this and I'm just like please just listen oh my goodness my answer to that was you, I had a, someone who used to tell me nine out of ten women would think the opposite of what I think yes. and I would say nine out of ten women go fuck all nine of them that was my answer I was, I was just thinking like damn you had a that was a nice way to say that yeah I could have said it that way I don't know but, uh, <laughs> that's the Gemini right that's the, yeah. the... Uh, the you even in your book I think you said uh, something about like the beginning of your pain when you noticed the pain you had and you said you were looking for someone to pull your finger yes <laughs> Because <laughs> like you, know why? Up you can fart, right? <laughs> well, okay, it's because totally yes, but um, and of course I, you know, the humor in the book is very important because we're talking about challenging things. But I, my brain was working so fast that I was trying to figure out what is going to relieve this. It's in my tummy. I, I, I saw my, I remembered my dad doing this funny joke about pull my finger, and I'm like, I'm just please, someone pull my finger. Like if that's what it's gonna take, do it. It's so stupid, but yeah, that's that's how my brain was because I, uh, I felt my, um, actually it was my liver that was um, dealing with all the cancer cells and stuff, and it was it was expanding so much that I could feel it, and I was in incredible pain, and I was a very young kid, so it was a small little you know organ and stuff. So yeah, yeah my, my mother, the registered nurse, was was yelling at my dad in the car because he missed one of the exits on the I don't know Verrazano Bridge or wherever they were, the Bronx Expressway. But man, it was tough, man. You know the hard part, and I'm sure you got y'all can relate. It's not just what I'm feeling. I feel what everyone else is feeling. Else around you. I felt my mother's anger. I felt my dad's not knowing what to do. I felt their marriage not doing very well from, you know, just all these things. And it's a lot to take in. And that actually leads me to a, a slight little detour. But I actually had to have my appendix removed. I think it was about a year ago. I was doing um, an interview with the Alliance of Experiencers. And I remember that moment when I was talking with my guides and I was like, how come I couldn't heal this? Like, how come we couldn't deal with this? Like, it's an appendix. I should be able to, it's like a cavity, right? I can, I can just quickly, you know, get it out and deal with it. But they said, no, they said, I've, I took on too much earthly experiences or too much pain and too much of everything uh, for too long. So it took 40 years for my appendix to be like, peace. <laughs> And the appendix is where you store. It's your extra storage um, of all your of all your. Interesting, because I had my I had appendicitis. I was just before I was 42 wow. and, I, and I had a burst. My appendix burst and I did. I didn't heal. I but I stopped it from from, you know, going septic and stuff. And at the hospital, they said, like, 
you're a medical anomaly because this should not have happened. But I was able to just, you know, stop it from happening. But I didn't, up until you just said that, I didn't realize that that's where we store a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we take in because I, I, yeah, I, I can understand that because as, as you're talking, it's like, I'm kind of reliving my childhood. Yeah. So thank yeah, you, it's Dad. It's really like a lot. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh. um, and, and I saw how you had some experiences in the hospital mm -hmm. with those children. Do mm. you think any of those children were possibly extraterrestrial in nature? Like, were you, you know, you're dealing with the burn victim and then some other kids and it, it's almost like, uh, like hmm. you're in a slow motion type observatory room where you have to like come in and, and now you guys are connecting mm -hmm. and building these friendships. I don't know. And it might be just when I'm, I was looking at it, it's just like how I just visualized it mm -hmm. almost almost like a little ET meeting of you guys, little souls. Cause you're all like special little kids with some real special stuff going on where other kids would be like laughing and playing it outside and rambunctious, but being in these situations where you guys health is compromised, it makes you even more of the observer mm. because you can't participate necessarily in what everyone else is participating in. It's like, it slows you down to a level of full, observation of everything that is again an amazing question um but my virgo moon must always be as authentic as possible and i will say that um the only sort of like uh, sort of extraterrestrial perceptions or whatever where i had other kids that I could recall usually happened in what I would consider to be either the dream state or astral. Um, and this was when I was a kid yes, um, yeah. throughout my growing up period. And so I do remember like ships and stuff and um, um, two people, especially observing uh, sometimes where the, where the, the, the glass or the, the is and stuff and then coming in and asking us questions and stuff. There's a lot of focused attention on things. Um, but in the hospital, I was that see, again, there's like the human experience. And then there's like the spirit. because you're not going to know that you're the ET, like she says, you think differently. So you think everybody is like the same, but they are looking at you like, hmm. like, and you know what, let's actually hmm. like, let's go with that because <laughs> it's absolutely accurate. For instance, I still feel completely foreign even though I've been on this planet for like 40 years, I still don't understand. And I, I, I have worked so hard. I went through a doctoral program, very logical, fitting all the argumentation to try and like make sense of, of how I can do what everyone else does. And it just does not compute. So, you know, what can we do, but just sort of continue our, our, our weird lives because it's what we're meant to do. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, segue. <laughs> no, that's not a segue. That's exactly on point. Um, I've, I felt like I was some type of litmus test for people, like throw her in the room and see if she sees yes. anything. And then we'll know. And then even one time, I remember my my aunt, my grandma, when she turned C now, this is how to the point where she trusted me as like a litmus. She thought people were trying to kill her. She had reached her point of Alzheimer's and she had some scissors. She heard a portion of a conversation where she thought they were giving her a pill, but it was going to kill her. And she said, only send Erica because I know she won't lie. And she had scissors and she was like ready to stab some people. And I'm like, grandma, calm down. But like, I was that person. I don't know why they believed me, but I would see stuff yeah. and I would be like, I would, I would see things and, and say, you know, oh someone was out the window or whatever. And, and they would just believe me where most kids, they'd be like, Oh, just calm down. Just, mm -hmm. just seeing things. And it was like, no, you know, a similar story. Um, when my grandfather was passing away, I must've been maybe a teenager. I can't quite remember. Um, but I remember the moment and it was almost universally sort of planned. I walked into the hospital room and my very loud, um, um, 
emotionally charged uh, Latina family members <laughs> were just blah, 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 you know, screaming all over the place. And all of a sudden, they just exited the hospital room as I was walking in. It was very odd. It was almost like a movie. Very, very weird. We, there wasn't even like a, you know, hello. It was just very odd. I sat next to my grandfather. Okay, what teenager does this? I was basically silent. I was somehow speaking to him like, or what I thought kind of telepathically. And I saw him almost like writhing in pain. And I just placed my head on his hand, uh, uh, my, my hand on his head. And I said, Grandpa, there's nothing else you have to say. You've told us everything. We love you. We know you love us. love us. I said everything apparently that he needed to hear because he was like this when the women left. It was like, uh, cause he wanted to hold on for them. But then as I was helping him, I saw the light like kind of glow softly with him in his like aura and stuff. And he just softly, softly just relaxed his face. And there were moments when he tried and then just sort of stayed. And I kept telling him, I'm like, Grandpa, whatever it is, you can tell me. You don't have to speak. I can hear you. Like, what teenager talks to their dying grandfather like this? It's just, and nobody was there to help me. So again, it's just, I feel as though people like us, we go where we're called. And I think that we hopefully are are and were strong enough to handle this this crazy adventure because these are remarkable times and there's a lot of people here that don't know what's going on. And I know how hard it is to even decipher anything really these days, but I feel like we kind of have an idea and I think we've had an idea for several years. How do you feel, Terry? Well, absolutely. And it's yeah. it's interesting because you know, you end up um, being that person that when you, like you say, when you walk in the room, Erica, it, 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 you know, you just, people just kind of like feel it. Mm. And it's not necessarily what you say, but it's the presence that we have because we're connected with our higher self, right? And so our ego doesn't really know <laughs> what's what what the higher self is is capable of doing. We just we just we're trying to understand. And so um, that's it's just interesting. It's lovely hearing you say these things because it's an app. It's a confirmation for us for our experiences. Not not only Erica and mine, but the people who are listening. A lot of people well, are probably having similar experiences. It definitely and, is. Susan says, "Hey, um, Matthew Turner's watching." Carrie Maya, um, she said, "I love this conversation." Leslie, she said, "The Gemini thing that she can go back as far as eighteen months old." And she's always felt like a foreigner. And hey, Matthew, Morin, he's watching Patricia, Muhammad. But yeah, this whole conversation is a segue. You can't plan things like this. And no. uh, just the <laughs> feeling that you get me, the, the drowning. Um, well, may I um, interject for a second? So oh. um, um, <laughs> I'm also like um, a medium and, um, and, I, and I do many things. But <clears throat> I was at a conference or a mind body spirit expo i don't know yeah. if you guys know those but in raleigh i think it was two weekends ago and i remember the last day i only had two days and i think i saw like 30 35 clients it was amazing it was really awesome um there was this woman who came over um erica you would love her because she had a little bit of a similar feel to her like colorful and beautiful mm -hmm. <clears throat> so she had a top hat on and the first thing I got was voodoo, but not voodoo. And I didn't know what that was. And she sat down and she, she basically was like, all right, let's go, you know? So she had 15 minutes to do a quick little reading with her. I guess, well, the first thing I get is, do you, do you practice something that's like voodoo, but not voodoo? And she's like, yeah, I do hoodoo. Or do you know uh, this particular, do you know what that is? Oh, yeah. It's like oh. being a kitchen witch, I would assume. Oh, oh, yeah, whatever. I don't know. Um, but she said, yes, I practiced this thing. And I said, I said, did you lose um, a young male from drowning? And girl, she broke down because I could feel him right to my right. <clears throat> and I said, but this wasn't your son, but it the relationship was close as a son. This woman looked like she was probably 39 years old at the most, most, 36 or seven. Oh, that's my girl. That's what she looked like. Yes. 
<laughs> and she said, she said it was my grandson. I was like, okay. And, um, and so I'm literally having a beautiful, by the way, I need to borrow that. I'm, I am, I'm dealing with a deceased child and his experiences drowning and everything. And the hurt grandmother who basically I found out during the reading raised him kind of and it was like the emotions were so much but long story short um i knew what she wanted um to be answered and he was waiting patiently to do so uh, and i said well the first thing that he wants you to know is um uh his experiences were was that he was lifted up out of the water and she broke down she was like all i wanted to know was you know what was his experiences and if he was okay and then i said but there's more because he's telling me that um, you used to tell him stories or read him stories about what the angels were like and this and that. Um, and she's just, she's saying yes, yes. And, and so he actually experienced that and you helped him transition without even knowing it. And I kept going. I think there was a few other things I remember something like that he knew that he was going to pass away early and the grandmother validated that and the grandmother said yes he actually said that to his mother a few days before and like the list goes on and on but all I'm saying is that there comes a point when we have to just embrace the the oddity that we are and um, hopefully with as heart-centered approach as possible continue to just show up and be that presence because what else is there you know we don't really feel like we are a part of this world of worlds where everything is kind of superficial and you know money money and you know this and that um, but all I can say is is that um, you know yeah. it took me a long time to to be able to call myself a medium because I was very scared of like what that would entail but when you fully accept what's happening and the responsibilities involved with that kind of stuff um it's almost as if it makes the process easier and so um again segue but talking about the oddities i was just gonna say all we really have to do is show up yeah in our yeah. life and you know our soul has has the plan and if we can just step out of the way of our ego then whatever we're led to do and we'll, we'll just do it just naturally without us thinking and planning you know because we can plan all we want but you know things don't happen the way we plan and you've got to just show up at the time right yeah and, and i also thought too um and I've, I've been thinking this for a little while now but sometimes i think to myself okay well how much power do we have to like overhaul our lives and or co-create other things and, and get out of things that we don't like or is there sort of a, an aspect of our soul agreement that we really did want to go through the crazy kooky stuff that we have i mean i don't think i would have agreed to having spinal taps and you know broken bones and all these things but and then, you know, a marriage that's, you know, on the skirts right now. But oddly enough, in this moment in time, I am so incredibly grateful for every single crazy, ridiculous, awesome experience. Like, I don't know how far you, you got in the book, um, Erica, but there's this one chapter called The Smell of Success. Oh. <laughs> it's when I, um, I ran the New York City Marathon. <laughs> it was the craziest thing because I didn't really train for it, although I would run for fun you're like cream you're like kramer on seinfeld okay <laughs> it just happened like I, I i went to a show my friend was in a show um 42nd street row theater something or other close to you know um uh, whatever it's called in, in times square and it wasn't the best show so during intermission i was like i gotta get out of here so i met this woman <laughs> it's okay i met this woman who had a ing new york city marathon jacket on i was like oh cool what's that well my guides told me to talk to her and when i went over there i chatted with her i was like man i would love to run the marathon one day and she goes oh well, we need volunteer runners like oh, what does that mean she's like well you have to help like um people with disabilities and stuff i was like i would love that i would love any which way i would I, I ride a bike or whatever is necessary to help the kids or whatever. And she goes, yeah, show up here and, um, and we'll see. Well, you're gonna have to read the book to figure out the rest of that because it's a very good story. But it very much happened on a whim. 
in like a day and a half, I had to buy new shoes. I had to buy actual running shorts and I ran the New York City Marathon <laughs> in under four hours. <laughs> I sprinted the last day. <laughs> it was amazing. But just think about how odd all this stuff is. It's just, it's absolutely crazy, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, when you say you wouldn't agree because we're, we're like mm. ants in the form of perspective. Mm. You know, it would, if, you, if you, no one would choose to die from our perspective or point of view, this mm -hmm. point of view, but uh, the above point of view where you know that you're the infinite part of the universe and hey, after this, you get to go have a latte, you know, then you say, oh, no big deal. I'm going to die. Like, you know, like our perspective is so small. Like we have even even knowing what we know, we could probably study met metaphysics as much as we want, but we'll never really have that full perspective until we get out of the shell. Now, may I ask you all a question? That perfect um, sentiment there. Have y'all, <clears throat> do y'all remember have y'all had that same feeling as a young child that of course we're all connected or of course like there's more than just this like how could you not even fathom that like right terry it's just i knew that since i was a kid yeah yeah i was a wanderer at that and i have no idea like a person in diapers walking down the street where people are mm -hmm. calling my parents like do you know that your child is going down this and they said i would walk miles and miles and i know where i was going anywhere where that i had seen some woods or some water or like a, that that's where i was going even up probably at least up until 10 years old, I was getting a whooping for getting completely muddy and lost in the woods and no, at no sense of time. And, uh, and I was like, well, what do you think? If, you know, if you tell me that you got dragons and fairies, then, Hey, I'm going to go find them. So I, I, I would be like I with trepidation, like, Oh my God, this, the woods were coming. Oh, like the I excitement. Can't, I can't believe you just said that because I made my younger brother and my dad at Optimist Park. It was a pool park close to where we're in Raleigh. I made them once in my life search for fairies in the woods with me. And bro, like I was on the Dead ball. Theory. I was going to find them. They were real. I was touching the trees. like, And they, they were like, what is he doing? But Erica, me and you. I love been... moss. I'm like, I was in the army, age 30 something years old, looking at moss with excitement, liking the little stuff that grows. Like I have stopped at this age, almost 50 and taking pictures of just, I just took a picture of, the of a bunch of moss. Like I'm yeah. just totally mystified by it. And, and it, it just freaking excites me because I know there's a little town and a little tiny city inside this, inside this little green clump of stuff. And there's all, some happenings and going ons on there, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's sort of like Hort, sort of like Horace hears Horton a who. Hears a who. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Horton hears a who. Who's yeah. Will. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I never thought of it as Whoville, though. Yeah, you're right. We are here. We are here. We are here. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will don't have the hair, though. if they're in my house, though. Yeah. I will. I'm sorry. But <laughs> but maybe that's why I, I love these peacocks so much. And so you had a a transition over the summer with your pet, mm. who I think he was talking to all of us at the conference. Boy, oh, he was talking. He was, he was really putting out the vibe. And I was like, oh, he is so tired of being here. Like yeah, in that. Yeah. He was the he was the quintessential, truly, truly, he was a God sent for me with me and honestly i have heard him you know he has come to me a few times and most recently a few days ago he he and he's transitioned but i can still feel it he pushed his beautiful snout against my face <laughs> during this one moment and i did not want to wake up but i was just on the verge and i was like don't don't move charlie as i love this i want to hold on to it it was the sweetest thing ever sweet sweet boy um but yeah he was always very wise you know even when i first had him i put him right here on my my um my shoulder and I was like um this is my this is my baby like how much let's do this thing you know but animals are amazing and Charlie is definitely here and um, he's a good good boy he hangs out actually when I give readings in my living room sometimes when there's deceased pets he actually like kind of helps bring them 
um, if if a deceased if if a, um, a client has had a deceased loved one, and I'm like, oh, like my dog's bringing like um, there was actually a black lab that came through yesterday for some person, and I go, oh, did you lose like a black dog? And they said, yeah, um, it was a black lab. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, all he's doing is sitting there waiting for me to throw something, and, <laughs> and my dog is just watching him because he never liked to fetch at all. So he's just this this beautiful little interaction, and they were like, yep, that's him. He all he would want to do is sit there wait for someone to throw something. So yeah, he's like an assistant, huh? But, yeah. <laughs> Like the person that babysits the kids, they're in the read. Like he babysits the other pets, they're in the read. And so you went to school for trans, how do you say, transpersonal psychology. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you, you said you were, was that a search for yourself? Was that something you were doing to help yourself understand? Or was it planned? Mm -hmm. Or was it accidental to get, become a doctor? Can you, can, can you just explain what yeah. transpersonal psychology is? No problem. Perfect uh, introduction there. Yes. So if you ask transpersonal scholars, this is why academia is so crazy these days. No one wants to give one answer for anything. Everyone has to have their own kind of interplay. So if you look at any sort of uh, scholarly stuff on what is transpersonal psychology, you'll get a billion, billion answers. Wow. But long story short, it is simply um, a process by which, um, or a study of looking at the things beyond the psyche alone. So the non-clinical track of psychology. So instead of getting a PsyD, I got a PhD in transpersonal psychology. And luckily enough, I get to study all the weird stuff that I've always loved since I was young, reincarnation experiences, out of body experiences, all of it made so much sense. And getting back to Erica's point, those two things you said, Erica, in the introduction, absolutely accurate, because it helped me understand my experiences. But also too, there was a psychic sense involved in it as well. Because when I was in kindergarten, God, maybe a second, I think it was kindergarten, um, we were drawing a self, uh, uh, painting a self portrait of what we want to be when we grow up. Well, I painted a doctor and I thought I kind of, you know, I thought to myself maybe because, you know, I, I was in the hospital and, um, you know, I had cancer and stuff, but no, it was different because my guys kept telling me, no, you're going to be a doctor. I was like, oh God, okay. Uh, well, I thought about medical school and then I realized, no, that's not accurate. So it took me a long time to realize, oh, you can be a doctor of like research and, and things that, um, you know, foster intellectual, you know, growth and conversation and stuff in scholarly discourse. So eventually at the age of 35, I went and got my, um, my PhD. It, it took uh, four years exactly, I think. Yeah. But I wrote my dissertation in five months, which is insane. A lot of my work has been channeled. Um, so we deal with everything from, you know, being able to qual um, quantitatively and qual qualitatively um, measure non-physical phenomena. So finding ways to, to validate certain, uh, certain individuals' experiences for whom they have had a great deal of um, veridical evidence or, or, or provable um, findings. So we're not just going to say- Miracles. Hey, Basically, they've experienced miraculous things, but you've found a way to quanti quantitize it or quantify yes. it. Right. And, and taking it a step further. So there's multiple ways with which one can um, deal with research. Like there's like, you know, um, scholarly inquiry. There's many other things. There's 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 different research designs. But in general, we try to take as much information about a topic as possible and find ways to then like meta analyze it and see um, where there's tangible proof and evidence beyond cultural norms beyond any socioeconomic whatevers, like finding more of the broader findings within certain topics that are kind of like um, taboo, you know, um, and there is a lot out there, just people have been conditioned to not believe or not be able to question uh, if their experiences are real. And after getting my degree, the conversations I've had with people, my goodness, people are like, oh yeah, I, I had a, you know, this orb show up and this and that. And I was like, okay, well, what color was it? Who do you think it was? What did it feel like? Did you have, you know, someone pass away recently, la, la, la. And then I connect with my team and figure things out. But um, this is, I think, a really good approach to healing more of the holistic aspect of, of people's lives rather than just what's up here. 
do you, do you find that people don't want to talk about those kinds of experiences, but it's more common than we would think because it, people are afraid to talk about it. And as soon as you open a door um, to conversation, people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but they don't, they're afraid to, of, be, of saying anything because they don't want people to think that they're crazy. But I think more people than not have these experiences, but they don't know. They put it aside because they don't know how to explain it or how to, um, you know, express it in a way that doesn't make them sound like they're crazy, but everybody has them or most everyone does. So um, I, I do live in a small town and I absolutely love it. Um, and I remember showing up the first day I went to the cafe in town, um, cute little place for lunch. And I met this wonderful woman who, who works there. I can't, I don't want to name names, um, but we, um, we had some wonderful conversations and um, she was very um, happy to, to, to see someone as open as I am in, in a small town um, because it was almost as if she was then able to kind of be more of herself as well. And I found, I found a beautiful way in which um, I've had great conversations with people who don't agree with me. I've had people, very religious minded individuals, simply say that's of the devil. And I absolutely allow them to to think and feel whatever they want to. And I will continue to have, you know, beautiful conversations with them as much as possible. Um, but no one has been outright rude or nasty. Um, and it's just been really, really cool. And I'll also say, I don't want to say too much, but I gave a reading to someone in town. <laughs> and um, they ended up actually winning. Um, uh, a large sum of money. And it was um, all of the information that I provided the individual and, and it was really great because it was came from the person's grandmother. And they were really, really happy to have that connection, but also too to have sort of their prayers be answered. And so they were able to find their religious meaning in those messages. So they were able to, to tie both of those pieces together. Um, and also too like, um, uh, you know, I have some certain people come over to my house and they, they park somewhere else because they are afraid of, you know, neighbors thinking that they're whatever. Um, so it is what it is. I mean, there's, you're going to find all types of people, but I will say when anyone steps in this house, it's all love and light. You know, I asked people in the chat, cause I'm just really curious. Has anyone, cause it, it seems like a lot of this happens a lot before the age of five, has anyone else almost died? Mm. And um, I, that's just me putting that out because I'm, I'm just really curious. Cause I've almost been electrocuted. I've almost drowned several times. Mm. But then I also was of the understanding that uh, that was like a negative ET experience before the age of five that I'm completely petrified and don't want to talk about. So um, <laughs> I, I'm collecting and observing on my own. Um, so I'm thinking that your perspective on life since since now you you've had this class, it's 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 definitely helped enhance maybe your gifts maybe because of the way you've studied in this aspect. Ah, good question. So you mean my my um uh, the the the, the doctoral school? yeah yeah it really has because oh my gosh okay so the reason why I um you know I I talk a little bit about and I wrote the book the chronicle series etc um I had my first past life regression at the age of like thirty maybe six or so thirty six and I was in a doctoral program and um we were at this beautiful retreat center. It was wonderful. And I remember the woman guiding us and I'm expecting to like, because I had already kind of been giving readings. So I knew what, what that world was kind of like, and I knew how to trust things and knew how to open up to experiences. The first thing I had was I was a blue being on a different planet. I looked down at my feet. They were blue long. I scrolled up saw my hands, saw the sky look different, things were buzzing around. It was very, very odd, but it didn't feel odd at the time. It felt very comfortable. 
And I looked to my left and there was a woman who looked like me and I knew that we were, and again, this is weird, but we were like partners, but there was no egoic attachment whatsoever. It was very high vibe, just pure love. And then there was like four kids running around and they looked like us too. And it was, I remember there was four emotions that I felt during this um, past life regression. None of them were complex whatsoever. They were the highest of vibed emotions and the purest that I can possibly fathom experiencing. It was pure love, pure bliss, pure understanding and pure compassion. That was it. And it was so unbelievable that as I was experiencing it, I knew to continue to give myself into the experience and to sort of put away my critical judgment for the time being. Afterwards, I wrote like eight blocks of the scenes that I experienced. And I spoke with my advisor at the time and she, she, she was, she was quite taken back. She was like, well, I don't think I've ever had anyone who, who had this before. Right. And that led me on the search to kind of find a little bit more of what my experiences were. And then after that, I had a QHHT session. Um, nice. But one, one small thing I wanted to mention in that past life regression at the end, I was on a slab that kind of was like a stone slab, kind of like a crystal slab or stone slab and had writing on the side, like weird, um, le weird um, drawing things. And I'm looking up and my family's all around me. And I know that I'm going up into the stars and that where I'm going to go, I'm answering a calling and that I would be back. So that's very odd, but that was what I experienced. And so possibly a sarcophagus, maybe, or a well, I don't you know. It's know making me think like, is this why we're putting these caskets facing up? I don't know, all the things that we do. Whoa, that's an interesting connection. I don't know interesting that's a good one i want to research some of i that. think we're vibing like we're just like <laughs> so, so so i'm just going to ask you a question do you think you were put into sort of like a stasis ah. at that time rather you know so part of your 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 um consciousness came to another place so you're you're in a stasis somewhere that you're still there but part of you is now somewhere else is that's my kind of take on it so I have, yes, I have kind of felt that in different ways. Um, <laughs> some some feelings I've felt humanly that that are a little personal, but that help me understand that that might be the case. Um, I could discuss that at some other point. But um, talking about sort of the starseed envoy kind of um, experience, that led me to start looking into that because that's exactly what it felt like. I knew I was going to answer a call. I knew I was going in the stars um, and that I would be back. So however that pans out. And also too, people like us, like I have never felt like I'm from this planet and I don't have a very hard time letting go of things that are not serving me or the greater good in, in you know? So it quickly. Takes, it takes me a lot to, to stay with things even past when I know it's not going to serve really. So I have worked on that, you know, even in my marriage too, I, I've been together with him for over 10 years and um, it's just sort of now kind of, you know, dissipating, but I stuck with it for as long as I could, because I know that that is like the human thing to do is to like, stay, 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 stay. I'm when... going to put it into words <laughs> because it's like a, it's like a childish, in a way, it's like a childish, immature thing. And I, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but from this perspective that we have, it's this thing of, why are you crying about dying when you know we're about mm. to go through X, Y, Z? I remember my best friend, when she moved, she gave me a picture the day she gave it to me. I ripped it up and threw it in the trash because I already knew, like, as a child, I was like, I'm never going to see her again. Like, mm -hmm. I just used to, and my, my mom was like, oh, my God, she thought I was a psycho. But I'm like, let's be, like, you're eight and you're like, let's be realistic. I'm never going to see her again. I don't use the telephone. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was just like, and, and it was just strange. I've had relationships that could... I mean, I probably freak people out. Like I can like you for two months and be like, that's it. Okay, that's enough. 
you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm always observing myself, like trying to make myself stay in places and do certain things when I'm like the whole time measuring, mm, I think that's it. Mm, I think that's enough, but then you're trying to be normal. Yes. So you stretch things out when you've already decided in one week, a three month relationship, you've decided in one week, it was really over. Yeah. Certain amounts of time when you're just counting, you're like trying to stretch it out. I don't know. You're, you're right. I will say that. Um, but I will say too, I have learned like a huge amount from staying, even though I admire people. That's I'm, why I admire Terry because yeah. her marriage was so long. I was mm -hmm. like, great. You've actually done work. And mm -hmm. th this is also another thing of it. Like a lot of people think strength is in anger and mm -hmm. going into rage and letting people have it, which I have fully equipped ability to do so and have done it plenty but then I also observe people who are kind and who are patient and who hold their tongue and I'm like I see actual true strength in that as well so I see strength in both sides of these yeah. things and she's done the work I think she's amazing because I'm I'm like I don't need I don't keep my cell phone long. I, I throw that on purpose. Like, I'm just like, I'm just like ridiculous. Like, I, I don't care. It's over. Set it on fire. And I set shit on fire a lot too. Um, a, whole, a whole chair, almost a sofa set on fire oh <laughs> on purpose. Like, I don't need this furniture anymore. Just set it on fire just for the thrill of setting it on fire. So yeah, this is a strangeness that... <laughs> Freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, I answered Terry's question because um, you know, I don't know, but no, not, not that we're saying less of your marriage because you you oh. you guys bonded and and yeah, yeah. Have, like these lessons. But then there's this lesson that says I have to go do this now, yes. and a lot of people want to give up that. But you know, this is that uh, that thing that we're taught. You know, America, two cars, two and a half kids living in a home for 60 years, like we're taught about, the, but this is not even our nature is really not to settle into these communities this way that we do. The way that we think, like we're supposed to just build routines. I don't think we're supposed to do that. That's not even what we come from. We're movers. And you know, with that, there is like, we live in a, in a construct of duality. Mm -hmm. So finding balance and harmony and <laughs> is very hard, but I often feel like it's kind of the only way sometimes. And there is, you know, if you go to the gym, there is, there is power in, okay, if I can do one more Repetition, rep, yeah. <laughs> what if I can do one more rep, if I can add one more pound, but sometimes those loads just get to be too darn much, especially if you're the only one kind of carrying it, right? So all I can say is, is that um, whatever and however things work out, I'm just um, so thankful that he was in my life and so thankful that Charlie, um, our beautiful doggy, was in our life for as long as, as he was. Right, like well, how our pets choose us. They choose us for a yeah. time. Waking up every day, walking that dog two or three times a day, making his food from scratch for like 12, 13 years. Like, long. Wow. Oh. <sighs> I like to say my son's 17. I hadn't cooked for him for 13 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> your food's over there. It's, it's in the closet, you know. Where I'm like waking up talking about what did you eat today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That, yeah, a huge segue. So, um, childhood dreams yeah because you had such a special childhood and i'm gonna say i'm considering it a special childhood um do you remember any of the dreams were did, do you feel like any of the dreams were influenced by the treatments that they were giving you or were they um like i, I would have some where i'm running jumping mm. leaping, flying things like that but then do you feel like Dreams before you had treatment and then dreams during treatment or after treatment. Are you still having some dreams or that are I, recurring? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I remember 
any dreams, I don't think, before the cancer years. I don't think. Because it was four. That's pretty young. Um, although, you know, I do remember one time, and it's just stuck with me for a very long time, being in my, and I don't know if it was a crib or some sort of a changing table or something, but being very not in control of my body and trying to kind of look around and see who was taking care of me, but I couldn't find anyone. Who's on the job? <laughs> I felt very abandoned and that feeling of abandonment definitely did stick with me for a long time. But I remember looking out the window at one point, finally getting my head to move over there and wishing I was back at home out there in the sky. So that's weird. But mm -hmm. um, some dreams. Yeah, a lot of, okay, one especially, that was recurring was, and it's kind of weird to say, but I'm sure we have some similarities. Um, all of a sudden I'm in bed, but in my dream, and ants start crawling on my bed and eating away the bed. And then I get up and I, I know exactly where I am because I'm in the house where I was living in, um, in this one particular neighborhood. And I try to go save my parents, uh, you know, when they were over there, I couldn't get them. Try to save my younger brother, couldn't get them. The ants kept coming. And all of a sudden I tried for my older brother downstairs, but I just left. And like, I'm watching the whole house being eaten by ants and they're chasing me. So that was like a recurring dream for a long, 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 long time. And then once I started kind of accepting a little bit more about like, you know, my gifts or whatever you call it, or my sensitivities. I mean, you know, what, what 13 year old boy, um, uh goes to a gas station and knows where to find and makes his mom buy him uh a um uh, what do you call it um what are those like magazine rags that people don't like but actually have some truth to it uh it was about Nostradamus oh the dirt gossip ones yeah one of those things but it was about Nostradamus's predictions and like 13 year old kid right or you know at a yard sale I picked up a, um, a tape on um, hypnosis how, on how to lose weight <laughs> because I was a fat kid not but how I, to lose weight but I collected psychology books yes and I would look and and for some reason I, I would collect like these opera like records I was strange and then um you said that book Oh, I'll think of it, but I, I used to have a strange it's not for certain matter. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I was obsessed with spontaneous combustion, spoon bending, anything. If uh -huh. I if a program came on and they started talking about some natural phenomenon, mm -hmm. I was Ripley's believe it or not. I think Love Robert it. just got through talking about one step beyond the outer limits. I'm all on it. I want the freaky stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully I answered your question. Lord knows. Well, you yeah, because I wondered if maybe you had crazy dreams while you were under the uh, influence of the dreams yes. as well. But then, and I don't know if it was the chemical, um, the, the chemical treatments. I don't think that had anything to do with it because I remember afterwards um, having more of the test dreams. Oh, and this, this was pivotal for decades. I don't think I've had these in a while, but they were for decades. So many test dreams, like um, being monitored, going through like a labyrinth or like a labyrinth simulator or something like that. And what, um, where would I go? Why would I go? What would I do when I experience this? It was all like social questions and stuff. And also it was very rapid fire. Terry, do you have a question? Yeah, I do, because my question is this. Do you think that that treatment coincided with what was happening with ET experiences? Well, this is yeah where we're going, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that that it was implanted? I, mm -hmm. I, this is just my theory. Do you think that your illness was implanted from those ET beings so that they could observe what the human child is going to have to go through so that they can use that information in their experimentation. So and then this comes this back to the kids. And it comes back to the group of kids who each have a different disorder and they're all in the same place. Exactly. Yeah. Um, ladies, I'm in the presence of some very wise ladies because I got chills right here. So like yeah. that is usually my indication that that is 
a very big thing that I have not really fully put together. And I think y'all put that together because I do know, actually, I did ask them way, way, way later. I was like, why did I have cancer? Like I, I was okay with, with what I needed to do. And they basically were saying something to the effect of it had something to do with like um, DNA manipulation and uh, seeing what what needed and had to occur and how you would um, react given these situations and stuff. So all of that is 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 very interesting. And here you are taking notes and they're taking notes and the observer in all aspects above and below. Right. In the body, out of the body. Well, I mean, because you said we would never, like, I would never come here and think that I would desire to get cancer, but it's like, okay, so you're, if you're the researcher and yeah. now you've implanted yourself and now you can observe and be like, wow, that was a really interesting experience. Hmm. You know, yeah. this is what it have looks you, like, feels like. I think you're exactly right. And have you ever had these, uh, um, these sort of, because you know, Erica, you and I were kind of talking about all these weird things that we used to like to do. I remember one time like many times finding myself out of my body while i was dreaming like get then, back <laughs> and then being like yo yeah like where do i want to go with this okay let's go out let's go into space let's go by the moon why i'm not able to go near the moon why are they not letting me this is weird like things like that um but yeah all of that stuff very I, true yeah. very true when when i would think of dreaming and i would come back and think well why can't i fly now i will look at my ankle and look for the mark. And I'm like, well, the mark is not there. This is why I can't fly. And I was just like, huh, <sighs> guess I'm stuck here with these people. Like I've always felt like I'm <laughs> with my family, like who the fuck are these people and why are you here? Completely, completely. <laughs> <laughs> what is your point? And I'm always that asshole too. Cause I'm like, so you did this because you think blah, blah, blah. I like walk, people would get so mad at me because I like, so you think that if you did this, that this is the right thing to do? Like the way I would say it, I'm like, they put her, put her back in the closet. It's like. You brought up a very good. Yeah. Yeah. You brought up a very good point there because I understand why it was kind of hard to probably be my mom. Like I was, I was a freaking angel for so long. Like you know, angel boy. And then I had cancer and then I was all the psychic stuff and I didn't know what was happening. And so, yeah, I'd be the one to be like, so mom, you know, like, um, if you're hurting internally, like you, we can go to therapy or, or you can do art therapy, or you can, you know, touch a horse or something. And like, you can actually get off your butt and do something like you can't say that. Like nobody wants to hear that. You know what I mean? Oh, tough, tough, tough. Wow. You know, Maya Angelou said, I know why the cave bird sings, right? Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other lady said, I know what it feels like to want to sing and have it beat out of you. So they couldn't beat it out of us yet, though, because we're yeah. singing. It I was tried. dark. It sounds like, did you did you ever go through an extreme depression after this? Sure. Like, how did you? Because I know, yeah, okay. So there was a time, man, I can't believe this. Um... I remember I went on tour with this social activism group for a little while. Um, and I kind of had a bit of a nervous breakdown because I didn't know like how or why I was taking on so much stuff. And I was kind of, I was kind of coming into my own as, you know, my part of my identity and stuff like that. And so I, I actually tried to check myself into a mental hospital when I got home to Raleigh, because I realized that most of my problems were like at home and I, I couldn't face it. I couldn't deal with it because it was too much for me. So I was like, can I please just like live in a mental institution? Because I didn't understand. Why did I want to live in Southern Pines? I wanted to take a break and I was no more yeah. than I wasn't even 30 yet. And I was like, I, I want a break. I just want to sit in some house slippers in a rocking chair yeah. somewhere. Yeah, and have it some- It didn't seem scary. But long story short, this beautiful woman named Hope, I think I did write a little bit about this in, um, in the Waiting for Life book, but she's like, honey, you ain't crazy. I love you. You are so- <laughs> She's, she's like, a doctor. Yeah. My son's a doctor. <laughs> You love them. <laughs> you love them. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I watch nothing but Jewish sitcoms. So anyway, 
<laughs> like Seinfeld and stuff. So anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Hope and you wrote about her in the book, and then I popped up the book. Okay, yeah. I think I don't know what chapter that was, but it is very real and authentic. Um, my book is it's nonfiction, you know, as much as it can possibly be. And I remember the the car ride home was not very pleasant. Yep, tough, tough stuff. So yeah, we were talking kind of about you know how family uh, challenges were, and and I get it. I would even say it in arguments. I'm like, I know this is hard. I just I either I speak to you and I try to listen and everything, or else I have to go back in my room. I don't know what else to do. Yeah. Yeah. Tough. Do your parents, are they still with you? Well, not necessarily. Like they are uh, still living. Um, uh, but I, I went back there to try and he like, to try and heal more for like them kind of, because I'm pretty good, you know? But I, I tried to go back there for a little while. I think this was maybe last year at some point. I can't even recall. Yeah, it's been like last year. And I realized how unbelievably dysfunctional of a life that I came from after not being there for- After being able to breathe fresh uh -huh. air and you come back and you're like, oh my God, I can't I take mean, five minutes. Yeah. From every situation, like- honestly like our house was never cleaned truly i it was i would i remember actually i don't want to say too much but i remember using the same washcloth that every single person in our family used for months it was grotesque but i didn't know any different nothing was cleaned it was very not cool and so when i went back it was like nothing changed like the parents still hate each other they live on opposite sides of the house like what am, what am I doing? My mom's a hoarder. Like, I don't know what to do. Oh, wow. So yeah, I just had to just be like, I tried for like two, two and a half months or so. And then I said, look, I'm so much happier elsewhere. And I have to listen to my soul and I can love you guys from afar. But it was so toxic and all the crazy abuse and stuff. I'm like, I gotta go guys. Like, I'm good. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's hard. And, and I remember going to one particular church and they said, so they would do counseling because it was this thing. What do you call it? Um, discipleship. So everybody, you have these meetings once a week. Like everybody thinks they're a therapist at this church. It's so funny. Because <laughs> yep. they feel like they could use the Bible to like help other people with their problems. But it's like no no one's a professional psychiatrist or anything. But I mean, it, it can help. But what they would say is that in couples relationships, they hide each other's sin. So I won't tell anybody you drink. I won't mess with you about you drinking too much if you don't talk about how much I eat you know what I mean like we'll say it to each other but we're not really going to correct each other or change because See, that, that's because they idea. reach a stasis yeah Do you and think so a lot of people like like you you all heal you want to come in here and try to save me like like get out they're going to kick you out the front door like we, we're doing good pass me those donuts and um, <laughs> you give me this cigarette and you, you and Daniel you get the hell out of the front door because we in here <laughs> We got our cigarettes and we're happy. Like <laughs> a lot of people think that they're going to heal and like go home and magically heal people. But you know, I have a perspective on this because the same way you signed up for the job, they signed up for a job and they're That's living crazy. out their job. And so I imagined myself with my mom and our higher selves arguing and my higher self being like, why are you so hard on her? And her saying, I had to do this to make her stronger mm. or else. If you imagine if you and your mom and your dad all got along and everybody was all happy and fluffy and eating cake, guess what? You'd have never gone out the front door. You'd be uh, staying with your parents for the rest of your life. I think a lot of people should think about that. Like they signed up for this job to toughen you up in a certain way to kind of like boot camp. Like by the time I went to the army, I told people there ain't shit you can really do. Okay. My parents, there's nothing you could do. My mom <laughs> they're done. And I'm in the army. I'm like yeah nothing was raising my eyebrows in here you know you can't you can throw my clothes on the floor you can throw out my locker do whatever you want my mom's already you know she's beat you <laughs> so there's this this training that we're going through and I think like oh man if I got along with my parents would I ever go to Germany would I ever go to Egypt would I ever leave South Carolina would I even leave Charleston this is beautiful um because I have noticed that 
all of this stuff and the reason why I went into kind of the psychological field and then also my mediumship work like when I deal with deceased loved ones I know what it feels like to step into certain experiences that I would not have known if I had a beautiful easy life so you're right I'm absolutely appreciative of all of that equipped yeah you're definitely equipped for every good work yeah kind of like you know I've worked in shoe repair I've done fast food I've done sales I've been I've worked at a hospital as a medical professional so yeah like you can relate it's like every every person you have something I never have a a run out of things to talk about I think some people like Carrie's on here she just calls me just to hear me tell a fucking story because it's never gonna be the same (laughs) She's like, oh, right, girl, I remember that time when I, and they're like, dang, she just got another story. Okay, I was just on my lunch break. That was a good story for that 30 minutes. I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> like, like, yeah, we got something plenty to talk about. It, 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 it's interesting. I just want to say is people have said to me, is there anything you haven't done? And I say, uh, no, I can do, I can do anything. I'm not going to say I'm a master, but I can do anything, you know, like absolutely. I grew up on a farm. And I've also been to uh, uh, <laughs> hoity-toity cocktail parties. So you know what? The whole spectrum is there. And if you can move through life and just say, this is life, right? Yeah. It's, it's mm-hmm. whatever, whatever life will put in front of you, you can walk through it. And you don't say, oh, I don't know. You just do it. You just go right in, like head, head on. I got mad at this lady at a, on a layover. She said, you're that girl that always has a story, aren't you? And I was <laughs> like, bitch. Like, but she was telling the truth. And I just didn't like the way that she said it. I was like, I'm going to stop talking to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> For a minute. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm back. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, she really hurt my feelings in the way. Ah, she, oh, uh, Carrie said, or Laura said she was jealous. She probably was, but maybe she watches a lot of television and felt like, you know, I could have a sitcom. Anyway, <laughs> my sister used to say this too, because like when I date somebody, she'd be like, so what, what lesson did they learn this week? Like, you know, this week on the Cosby show, like what lesson are y'all teaching this week? <laughs> Literally, long, 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 you know. I feel like I was raised like by the television, but honey, Amen 227 Cosby show. I mean, facts of life, different, different strokes. I mean, those were like my, even Roseanne Barr, <laughs> like the all Roseanne, of them, like yeah. my, my parents and my family. Jackie was the weirdest freaking person. It was interesting. Was she not? Have you seen T- United States of Tara? Oh no. Well, she has, um, she has schizophrenia. I think she has multiple personalities. Oh. Like she goes all out. Her sister gets on my freaking nerves. I don't care what movie she's in. I'm like, I don't like you. <laughs> I get stuck sometimes. So, but yeah. Um, but uh, okay. So, so this is what I find too, is a lot of people, they kind of root for the bad guy. Mm. I have noticed that like, I don't have a television. Actually, I have two and they're off in the sunroom area somewhere. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't. I, for me, I I don't like it. But but people aren't learning the lessons. They learn the opposite. Like you're supposed. You're like so. You you said waking watching two two seven. You were like yeah. So yeah, never yes. steal the bike. And the yeah. other people are like, damn. When you steal the bike, make sure you got a lookout. Like oh, uh, like they get like a whole different thing out of it. And you're yes. like looking at people like what the what? I I find myself dumbfounded a lot of times. Absolutely. And I will also say too, that through my theater work and musical theater and stuff, I have learned even through the lyrics of songs like Sondheim, my God, even though he was probably a wackadoodle, there are some very prolific messages in those songs and stuff. And a, a lot, lot of people that, don't even listen to the song. They don't, they don't. Yeah. So I feel as though my, 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 my prowess was always like steering into the direction of the either abnormal or non-traditional ways of communicating. Um, And then of course, eventually then I went to writing, which is a bit more of a standard form, but I mean, all types of music and performing and theater and dance and ways to express um, oneself. I feel like that is usually a great way to get through 
kind of habitual patterns or habitual ways of thinking about things in a certain way to get you to really branch out and sort of experience more about, you know, certain topics or, or subjects or even ways in which you can relate to people. We're not going to keep you a lot longer, but I mean, I did have someone here who was, uh, she was a theater teacher and a theater major. She talked about the Alexander technique. Yeah. Um, and then, and then too, I guess what you just said, like it allows you to go through different kinds of emotions because maybe the experiences of the characters aren't the, your experiences, but it allows you to go through and experience different emotions and stuff. But what are you finding when you observe your students? I mean, what is, what is, how do you even express that? What you're finding when you're with your students, when it comes to music and theater? Yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. Huh. Um, well, Any observations? And, yeah. That you. Well, first and foremost, um, I think as a teacher, and again, my moon's in Virgo, so I can be a little critical, <laughs> a little judgmental, um, yeah. but it, it makes it for a good teacher. Because then you have the crazy Gemini who's open to whatever. But um, I can quickly, easily sort of assess someone and I can sort of feel into where they are and perhaps where they want to be. So whenever I am approaching um, a singing lesson or something, I never want them to sound a perfect way or a certain way. I want to bring out a little bit more of who they are while doing it in a healthy manner. And I feel as though that's what I help my acting students do as well. When they're playing a character that is very different from who they are, I say, what are the aspects of this character in you? And how can you sort of tweak or amplify or or subdue or, you know, little degrees of, of, of challenge and change there to bring this story to life? Even though, you, you hey, you may not even di- agree. Like I know I'm, I'm in a show right now, Clue, at the Imperial, uh, close to here. It's really cool. I play the Wadsworth character, which is like the Tim Curry character. And there are certain aspects that were written into this particular part of the production that is, let's just say, politically motivated or whatever. And it is my job to kind of portray the thing, but I can do so as the actor the way in which I feel I feel the character would be given the fact that this is my incarnation and I am bringing it forth, right? So there's this beautiful balance where um, you can work within the constraints and then find ways to, to branch things out and to get people to think things to, to think about things in different ways. So if, for me, it's about you know what other colors can we provide to, to, to a, a person's practice? and um, what needs to be uncovered, you know, so. So, I've heard in actors, like actual Hollywood actors, like you hear people say like they channel the Mm. character or they uh, take on a spirit sometimes. And I'm not making a suggestion of just repeating this, but is it something that you believe that can happen is a person can get lost in the character or is it more like an innocence loss? Cause it's like, you're going through this thing that you've never felt or experienced, but now you, you're, you're taking it on. It, it's like an actual lifetime just through acting. You've taken on a, new, a, a new character, but that a person can fundamentally change because of it. There is a lot to say, and I'll do my very best to be brief about this because I've not only studied it, I did kind of want to do a little bit of a dissertation similar to ah, this. Ah, I hit you. So That's what it's like. I'm gonna try, all right, long okay. story short. There is a lot of um, research in flow state. Okay, so flow state, there's a lot, the, the, the individual's last name is very hard to pronounce. It's like Russian or something, but it's C-H, Kimmerk or something or whatever, but you'll see it's a long name, CH something, I something, um, flow state uh, research. And he, he studied a lot of uh, athletes and wh- how, how they experience the flow state and what that is like, and if there's any correlations between channeling and whatnot. Well, let's take it a step further. So when I do my mediumship readings, I definitely keep things very high vibe. My team knows, don't you show me no nasty stuff because I've been there, done that when I was a kid and I, I got interested. So they, they, because I've established a relationship with them and I honor my own sovereignty, they respect my boundaries. So we keep things very high. I do a very quick meditation when I first start with the individual, keep it very high. 
um, everything of God, you know, only of you know purity of God and stuff like that. Um, so there, there are there are ways in which <laughs> the creative individual, who is often on a path of great challenges, given their natural proclivity to want to experience as much of something as possible, which usually also correlates to uh, loose boundaries, I guess you could say. So all of this interplays with things. So if you are trying to tap into a character, like maybe using a Meisner technique or something like that, where they sort of live the character, that was quite popular a little while ago for several decades and stuff. I understand its utility, but all in all, if you're portraying a character and you have a job to do, um, you don't really have to go to the fullest extremes. And I will say Hollywood has its huge, huge, huge problems. And I think we're all very well aware of that nowadays, thank goodness. Um, so it's important to, uh, to know your, your um, limitations and your um, speak with your team, the ones who you're connected to on the other side as well, because if you're not protected, uh, things can get really ugly. And I think we've even seen that in our community where there are certain individuals who are kind of being overrun a little bit and allowing themselves to be, um, you know, taken for a ride and taking the rest of us for a ride. Um, but um, so when I'm when I'm doing my channeling work, when I'm writing, I don't do the traditional channeling like a seance or some some crazy stuff like that. I light a candle, I connect with my team, I put my fingers to the keyboard, and I say what needs to be said. And then for me, my process is, uh, if I don't have a flow just then, I then connect with my team and I go to the Akashic Records and I say, hmm, this book's already been written. Let's see what it let's see what page by page it looks like. And then I go from there. So that is one little um, trick that I do. Um, but oddly enough, because I have a very good memory for things, I can literally see the page, but also too, I can hear my guides and I can hear the characters speaking. So it's very simple. And I will tell you, I say this every time, the Chronicles series book, so the Chronicles of an Arcturian Envoy, uh, especially the first book, it was written in cha 20 chapters in 20 days. That was basically channeled. I didn't even know who the characters were until my fingers were on the keyboard writing the characters and what they thought and felt and everything. And I would I would talk to my editor and text them while I was writing and saying, oh my God, guess what? This character is related to this character and they do this and they do that. Can you believe it? And um, I had no blueprint. So that for me is evidence that channeling is real and it doesn't have to be so scary. And also, too, there is a lot of like nasty stuff in Hollywood. So people have to be careful, especially in the performing arts world. Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for the glory of yourself or other things? Or are you doing it for something higher, maybe a therapeutic reason or being able to connect to people um, in a way that is nurturing and fulfilling for all of all involved, like a service to others rather than a service to self? That was why I got out of um, performing full time, and I just do it now for, you know. For I think that is the road that that it the that people go down when they're saying, "I will do whatever it takes," and that needs to be like, "Ooh, guess what comes after that?" You know, <laughs> when you say, "I will do whatever it takes," or "I have to do," yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's it. That's the magic. Yeah. phrase right there depends I, on when i see people that, that's when you get yourself in trouble yes. and i and that doesn't necessarily just mean in hollywood because i've seen people do that at jobs and they were like well i gotta do whatever it takes for my kids and i'm like okay because i have like these boundaries where i'm like okay i'm not doing that and and whatever it takes doesn't come out when i'm thinking about anybody's job or money or or things like that i'm not willing to do whatever it takes you know, yes. to you do that. That's, that's, you know, that's you stripper can... talk, y'all. Stripper yes. talk. Okay. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. If you compromise yourself, the individuals who depend on you will see that. And w what is it going to take for them to quickly say, well, my mama did it my, might as well. Right. So it's like, uh, it's so hard to, to be as um, 
as integrious as possible, which is not a word. I like it though, but I like it. that's the alternative, you know? Mm-hmm. See, so she feels me, Tara feels me. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to say, and uh, I was to put your hats back on, Tale. <laughs> I made this hat. I looked Beautiful. and found this striped stuff. I was doing Papa Legba from American Horror Stories. I don't, I don't know that one. You don't need to know it. You don't need to know it. Um, so, because you talked about your guides, uh, you have a great relationship. You knew them as a child or has it built since childhood or how did you even get in touch with Well, or bring in your full counsel? If yeah. you can just give a little about that. What was well, I when, think? I was, yeah. when I was in the hospital, I could feel... Um, the emotions of people and I could hear their thoughts and I don't know if it was because of just who I was or am or if it was because I knew what tremendous pain was like at a young age so there is a lot of research on like trauma-based you know you know uh, paranormal what trauma triggers the split that we need to enhance our psychic ability that's not necessarily say need but I will say that that trauma does create or can create a bit of a split to some degree where it depends on level, et cetera, and also intention behind all that stuff. But there are certain ways in which people can open up certain, you know, uh, conscious levels or, or, or aspects of their psyche uh, that can be either utilized or weaponized. We've, we've seen that with MKML Ultra and many other government programs and stuff. Um, but with regards to the cancer stuff, there was never an intention of the individuals that were treating me of ill intent. So I never felt like I was Ooh. like chained. Although um, <laughs> let's just say that there was, there was an aspect of what I was experiencing that I kind of agreed to and I, understood and respected that so that's why i didn't have to go too crazy and all that but i could i could hear my guides like telling me everything's going to be okay and they also said that too several times trying to remember exactly when but um in the hospital bed uh oh also one time too so i woke up because i sensed someone in the room with me and they were very very tall and they kind of scared me not in a evil way but i saw someone in the room with me and I pulled my um, IV drip out of my uh, hand as I was running because I I was trying to run for someone I was trying to run for like a mother figure or something and my mother was not there you know she's at home so I remember in my crazy state right I'm just spewing blood I don't know what's happening and I'm going down the hallway and this nurse on the night shift she saw me and before I passed out she was able to take take care of me and put the IV back in and everything but at all these little things like um it's it's strange especially when you hear like a loving voice but then you might see something that scares you as a child because you don't know it, it, it can sometimes mess with you. So that's why for a little while, I didn't really tune into too much stuff. There'd be a few things I would do, like we'd be on a road trip and I'd say, there, my my mom and my little brother were like, hey, which car is gonna be dad? Cause he was coming from the New York city and stuff. And I'd be like, oh, he's gonna be the eighth car. Yeah, you know, and he's gonna be, you know, he's gonna roll down the window and say hi or whatever. And it was snowing and it happened on the eighth car. And my, my little brother was like, wow. So these little things like, you know, and I would, I would, um, I would know, like, for instance, in school, I would know some of the answers to certain things, and I couldn't explain it, you know, and I think it was because I was given the answers. And I will say that that stuff has happened throughout my life, and I'm very appreciative of it. But in the beginning, I didn't know really what it was. So, yeah. Is that why I could sleep through things, and people just knew I was going to fail? <laughs> <laughs> And I'd be like, gotcha. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. We were able to just answer questions. A lot of knowing. A lot of you're, just knowing. You're very connected, Erica. Like you're very connected to to your team. Just even the way that you process and think and stuff. And you're very much like 
you it's not go by the seat of your pants but it's go but go by the the intuitive impulse i feel ah yeah. so that's different from impulse control right no it's uh-huh. <laughs> so funny that word was on my mind today funny um yeah definitely for for me to not see visually very much the knowing part because I was trying to think what's the difference a clairvoyant and a clear um cognizant or cog yeah is is so different because you're like I don't know I just said it like yeah no you just say it you're like I have no idea you kind of look stupid sometimes (laughs) because people want some fancy explanation and they want the the visual and you're like I have no idea dude I'm just saying stuff because I think when we visual uh, it when we well, see the clairvoyant things, yeah mm-hmm. yeah when you're doing that then it's open to interpretation but when you know something you just say it because it's just it's there it's it, right yeah. you don't have to interpret anything you just you you just know it you just say it but as soon as you start to visualize or hear things then then there is a process that goes on within the brain right so then we start to have dealt with it but i think when you have that clear cognizance you just like I don't know where it came it's from. It's funny it because, came. like I was telling Terry the other day, it's funny because people want to see tarot cards and they want to hear them shuffling. That's what they want. They want. <laughs> they need that noise. Well, what you gonna say? But I just told you the same thing. You know, like yesterday, I just told you that. And I'm. I, I don't know. It's weird too because you're living a life where you think everybody sees the same thing you see, and you're like, "Are you psychic?" You're like, "No, I'm not psychic." <laughs> And you're like, like looking at people like, I thought this was common sense. But this was... <laughs> and uh, not not common everyone... sense ain't that common. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone wants to hear. And I, I always shy away from saying like the truth because there can be many mm. things that can be the truth or whatever. But I mean, you know, it's a kind of like subject. when you visualize an object underwater. Yeah. 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 And wow. but but sometimes things the hardest part I think Terry um, when it comes to clear, clear um, cognizance is having the courage to speak the thing that you know because there's many times that I did not growing up and right. I really wished I did yeah you know, yeah because you don't want to, you don't want to seem like yeah. stupid or like where are you getting that from and yet you have this knowing and it's just like. Yeah, maybe I should have said something, but it's like, meh, no, <laughs> it's still like that. You know, years later, it can still be like that, but it's, it is. Well, there was this, um, I remember this one guy that my uh, dad was doing business with. He was doing some renovation work in the house and I met the guy I, before I even met him. I just like, I was approaching his energy and I'm like, dad, don't go into business with this guy don't do it he's like danny come on forget about it oh he's cheap it's fine i'm like no no, no. don't do it i'm telling you he's gonna take you for your money well of course you know weeks later he, he, he takes all the money and he leaves he doesn't do any work and i was like dad that's a lot of money but, um yeah sometimes you just know it and it's up to the other person to what they want to do with that information i think we got some chats now yeah um do we got some? Oh no, go back, go back. Oh, we had some good, uh, good uh, comments. I think Scott's in there now too. And um, I don't know, you might have some different ones on your page. I told Mark, I said you're late. You're gonna have to catch the replay. But yeah, I think you gave a lot of good insight and on staying grounded and focused and out of dabbling too much with others spirits, spirits you don't recognize. Because the thing that I um, hear most is that you go through your guides first, or basically it's like your connection with source and your guides. And then, you know, you can branch out. But a lot of people, I I don't really hear that kind of talk. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, I channel this and I channel that. And it's like, Uh, okay, well, where's your, um, where's source? Because we don't know who you talking to. We only know I mean, I've even heard people talk about having sex in the astral. I had a, a group and they asked me, so how do we do work in the astral? I said, go to sleep and don't worry about it. Because if you're supposed to be doing it, you're already probably doing it. Because your higher self and your, you know, your, 
you this ain't something you need to go you know and and, and mess with too much because I think like the jobs that you're doing you're doing it and it, I don't know yeah. everybody wants to be Harry Potter right now they're watching a lot of stuff and they're taking in a lot of stuff not really understanding the people who have these jobs they're already doing the jobs and I like yeah. uh, Ma- Matthew um, was talking about that book the art of dreaming and yeah. A lot of people are accusing people of whatever kind of entities they're seeing and they're blaming it on other people when you're messing around in the dream world and you're bringing your own stuff back and you're blaming it on everybody else. You're kind of like blaming everybody else for the things that are happening in your life. And so. um, Preach. Yeah. Well, you preach. That's what I'm talking about. I'm trying to, I'm here to see you preach. (laughs) I mean, it's true. And honestly, I'm, I'm certainly not the only one who feels this way, but I am not as um, involved in the community as I was before because I have uh, definitely brushed elbows with a lot of the big wigs and um, I have realized that um, the only person I can honestly truly believe is myself and I don't people. So the ones that I do follow that I'm friends with on Facebook and in real life and stuff, they're wonderful and God, you know, God sense and stuff. But if anyone is claiming to be the, the end all be all of the wah, wah, wahs and stuff, no, ma'am. I Ooh. have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. The, the great, the great Oz has spoken, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The great Oz. Oz. Gandalf, Gandalf, the gray, all of y'all <laughs> just get your shit you know just calm down you know because here it is and everybody is always talking about what they want to happen and it you got a, a this is basically a spaceship with nine billion people and your thoughts of understanding of what you think should happen they actually don't really mean shit to nine billion people so <laughs> and uh and like i said we got this little perspective even though we're connected to our higher self and source like we get to see this much and 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 that's for a reason. Yeah, and what are it's the that, intentions? Uh, it's that uh, it's that grandeur that's seeking the grandeur to think that my vision and my thoughts are more special and my needs are more special. That's kind of taking people down this road of I'll do whatever it takes. You know. There you go. You got it. So we'll let you wrap up. How do people find you? And how do we find all these books? You all know, <laughs> wait a minute though. This Arturian series, okay. Yes. We're, we're gonna let you wrap up because we're gonna save some of the spice for YouTube, y'all. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, it's so anyway, funny. we're gonna let um, you wrap yes. up. Yes. So I'm on. Um, I'm writing the third book of the Chronicle series. It is very funny because my guides can be very funny. I'm sure all of you know our teams can be because. <laughs> Um, the first one was written in 20 days. The second one was written 40 days. And I have a feeling this next one that I'm on right now is going to take 80 days because it's like doubling each time. Because it's just, you know, life, life happens and I'm going to be starting teaching next week. And I'm so excited about that. I'm also, yes, I've actually been um, requested to publish someone's book. Um, so That's I'm, right. you know, it's a great contract. So I am publishing uh, this individual's book and working on making that as 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 best it can be so i'm excited because um they're they're kind of a bit of a member of the community and um, i haven't quite mentioned you know rob's thing yet so um we also have that um, potential as well um but then so many other things um, my mediumship work um danseda.com so www.danseda that's s s and sam e d a dot com my life coaching company slash my consulting company is multiviewing.com multiviewing.com you guys can find me on facebook um you can also find me on twitter i have a bit more of a political persuasion on twitter you know you have to have a little bit of that humanness and mm. i know days. it's like where do i talk shit where can i go to there talk shit because <laughs> yeah. sometimes i'm looking at what i really have to say and i'm like mm, put it in there. <laughs> Because you know, like my, I this is my second Facebook account because I deleted it because there was a time okay. when it was necessary. But you know, the whole lockdowns and just madness. But I was posting things that literally, if I kept, would be completely all true. Like nowadays, it mm. was all the things that were going to happen and happening. But I let that go 
because of certain you know reasons. And at the end of a very good movie, they'd put you in jail. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And there were. <laughs> oh, we all guy knows everything. He knows what happened. You know, and my team knows, so they're like, you need to close up shop. So I did that for a while, but now I'm back and um, just in a different space and really enjoying things. And gosh, there's so many other things I can't think about, but yeah, I'm still teaching uh, piano and voice and I teach dance. I teach ballroom dance uh, locally. It's really cute. I love every minute of it. So lots of stuff going on. So I snipped the live stream so that if somebody wants to see what else you had to say, yeah. they're gonna have to come to the youtube channel and watch it again but um yeah. what qualifies you to do the chronicles is well, it just strictly the the fact that you're channeling or is that the octarian is that a part of your soul group? so that goes to my question that i typed to you dad Are oh you that yes yes and it's perfect question so this is youtube land right yeah, this is YouTube. Okay, now. <laughs> okay cool. Because I had I had asked Dan. I said so uh, when when we were finished the other live. Um, do you think that that past life that he was talking about was he an Arcturian? So that was my question for him. Yes, wonderful. So here's the hard part. It's like I do my very best to give credence to the things that I can really really prove. But then the hard part is, who am I proving to, right? Mm -hmm. So I can only be who I am and, and, and know what I know. So ha having that experience and also having an out-of-body experience when I was 25, where I was hit by a taxi in New York City and my physical body went flying, I mean, the whole kit and caboodle. But what I experienced was some tall, very tall, long armed, strong, but beautiful and, and um, generous of spirit person entity hold me in his arms like I was the most precious baby in the world. Okay, I'm 25 years old. I'm kind of a lanky, you know, lean muscle yoga dancer guy <laughs> in New York City. And my physical body's flying through the air. It was hit, bam, bam on the car, sliding my face. My whole face was messed up and stuff. But all I remember feeling was this on my bottom, tall arms lifting me up, placing me delicately on the ground. So that is my experience. I even told, yeah, I even told, um, the 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 women uh, uh, the the doctors at the hospital what happened and they thought I was crazy but it's true, and then here's the here's the kicker, because of the impact what happened how fast they were going the whole thing, the front of the car was smashed in. I ended up not having to pay anything because the taxi company paid for it, but and my face was all messed up it was all bloody and everything, they thought I needed. I was going to have to have plastic or um, reconstructive surgery for for certain things, but the the few hours that I was in the hospital, I don't know what happened. But as the doctor was picking out all the things, I was then put into sort of a room to wait for surgery. Another female doctor comes in. She takes one look at me. She turns the light on and she's like, "Are you are you Dan? Are you the same person that had this?" I'm like, "Yeah." She goes. Um, I don't think you need any surgery. She's looking at me over and over and over. And, and, and apparently I was, I was fine. I had no broken bones, no nothing. And then she said, you know, cause it was New York. She said, okay, well, since I'm here, you know, let me see what I can do. She did one tiny little stitch basically to make me, you know, to bump the price up, you know, it's New York. Um, um, the one little stitch, you know, up here and that was it. And I went home. Uh, maybe a day or two later, the gigantic bruise on my lower back gone, the site of impact on my left um, soleus muscle, um, gastrocnemius, I forget what it's called, but um, that was fine. And then there was one other uh, thing that I think that was pretty much it. And then my face was fine. So that's odd. And then it was this, and I realized that that same energy, that same loving spirit was the same entity that I had when it, in my near death experience, because it was the same, and I wasn't supposed to look at the being both times, although I could feel him or them or whatever. Um, so that right there was two big 
hits of evidence for me. Then my past life regression, when I was the blue being, then my QHHT session that I had with a wonderful man named Daniel Rekshan, R-E-K-S-H-A-N, wonderful QHHT um, person. And when we had that regression, oh my Lord, it was the most incredible thing um, because the same being showed up and this time I could see his face and it was Arcturian as much as I can fathom an Arcturian is. And here's the other thing, my guides never tell me like if they have a name or where they're from because they're, they're so non-egoic. They're just here to support. And so I had this little Merkaba, which is purely gorgeous, this gorgeous quartz Merkaba. Oh, it's beautiful. And I had, thank you. I had this on me on my chest during the QHH session. And when I was finished those hours of QHHT, I took the crystal off and the crystal was piping hot. And I thought that was very interesting because there was no sunshine on it. There was no nothing. I was in kind of a darkened room, Um, you know, a little bit of sensory deprivation there. But the fact that it was on my heart chakra and that it was like piping hot was really cool. I thought that was really fun. And I didn't touch it or anything either. Yeah, I don't know. So, and then also too, um, I did chat a little bit with um, uh, uh, my friend Vivian Chauvet, Chauvet, who is kind of an Arcturian um, hybrid, and she also did kind of see some arc, um, some Andromedan connection as well. So, I understand that too because whenever I'm having a hard time articulating myself emotionally, or at least allowing my, my, my Gemini air sign to, to feel an emotion before I understand it, they do kind of come in and help that heart-centered aspect of, of who I am. And I can only just simply come from the, the, uh, the, the, sense, the senses, the feelings, the sounds that I hear, um, um, and the, 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 the visionary things that I've gotten when, um, when I, when I, have my sessions and it's very similar to when I give my readings and because I've been able to have such successful readings many 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 of them it's just further proof for me that there definitely is a larger world of worlds out there that we're all connected to have you have you read the book by Jose Arwellis the Arcturian probe no I haven't read much probably try not to read anything about anything with when anybody else is Uh, No, I was just wondering because it it was a book, it was a book he wrote, oh, probably 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so um, I read it before getting into a lot of the knowledge and information. And I found it so interesting because a lot of the things that he talks about in the book they're starting to make sense now. And so, so I was just wondering whether, because I at, at the time I read, I didn't really know anything about the Arcturians, but what, what it, it was a history about it. And it's it's actually quite fascinating to read it now. That's, that's I was just wondering whether you'd ever come across the book. I so. haven't, no. and, and oddly enough, you know how when things happen cosmically, you just go, okay, it happened. Um, I had, two Arcturian books that I was actually going to read. I forget which ones they were. I got them for Christmas and they were in my bag. And I, again, my crazy terrestrial slash non-terrestrial sense, I washed my luggage in the washing machine. And my mother-in-law was like, why would you do that? I'm like, I don't know, but I just wanted to clean it. And unfortunately those books were destroyed in it. So I never got to read them. So you weren't meant to meant to, <laughs> to, to read it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, inter- it's interesting. Yeah. Um, I believe they're outside. Okay. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's interesting just talking about the Arcturians because uh, um, I have a, a little place out in the country and a friend of mine keeps telling me, you know, there's a big Arcturian ship sitting over that property. And um, I just find that just kind of very, it, it, it's interesting because I know that there is an Arcturian connection and and um, so I just want to... Um, yeah, it, it's just interesting. So when you see the, those giant beings, did you say they were blue? Well, it was like a kind of a lightish. Well, the hard part is, is that I wasn't able to look at. Right. So 
near death experience and then the one who was holding me he was holding me from behind like like he was like a father figure kind of yeah um, but when i had the past life regression it was like lighter blue so who knows if that was andromeda i don't know in fact it probably was given the fact that i did have julia balaz do my galactic astrology right yeah and apparently my oldest lifetime was arcturian and my most recent lifetime was andromedan Ooh. apparently it has been you know proven astrologically i guess you could say but then when i um had the qhh session it was darker blue it was like a darker purpley blue kind of mm -hmm. so who knows and that's just our perception of it right yeah, because I know Vivian's connections there, like with the council and stuff, like she has more of a, like the, the, the white, the, the whiter, the whiter beings. And I mean, apparently, I think there's three different colors of them and stuff. But then again, there's also like inter, inter, you know, believe, I mean, we are, we're interbred, God knows. Right, in a species. Yeah. yeah, like 22 or something, genetic species. Yeah, or so how, you know, the, the, the thing is, too, is there's different dimensional aspects of them as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's so funny, too, like even growing up, I just knew there were multiple dimensions and, and multiple densities and stuff. And I was almost just waiting for science to catch up because I was one of those kids, like in history class, especially, and in science class sometimes in math but not too much i would be like what is this joke like what that's maybe why we were so bored is because we were yeah. like oh, can we get to the metaphysics can we get to the real quantum stuff can you start talking about some aliens or something like we weren't really <laughs> talking about any real phenomenon in science class and maybe that's why we were so bored I, I i just i have to tell you when i when i was a you know we went through the whole um bay of pigs thing and the whole idea of the nuclear holocaust you know mm -hmm. back in the 60s and we had to do drills where we would hide under our school desk and boy that was just but the interesting thing was like oh here we go again mm -hmm. and it's just like you know if this happens i know i'm going to survive this thing and i it's just like oh i'm going to be by myself again and mm -hmm. you know like it was the stream of memories and it's like where does a seven-year-old get that from and yes. just that whole idea of oh i'm gonna survive this and i'm gonna be by myself again you know like that whole and that was the fear that i had of being by myself again and having to go through it again so it was a it, it was just very strange like and i you can't talk to anybody about it because nobody could understand my my mother tried to but you know and you but she i couldn't say those things right oh no well we all know i mean i had a, a an irish catholic mother um born in 1950 and um if you would even mention anything that was out of the box that was you know some devil stuff so I get you, my friend. I understand how hard that was. And you know what's so funny? Actually, my Nana's coming in. Sorry. Um, but um, my Nana passed away. I think it was January of 2022 is what she's saying. I don't remember. But um, I went to her funeral and that was the first time I'd ever kind of like seen my family kind of all there. And um, I remember her, her coming in to me before I got to the parking lot of the wake. And I was with my friend Ashley, who is a wonderful, dear friend of mine. And I was like, oh my gosh, my Nana's here. And she's telling me to not be upset if she doesn't look so good in the casket. And I was really sad. Like, I was like, oh my God, because like her looking good was like really important for her. Like she was, you know, a product of the what, 20s, 30s or something like that. And, um, you know, she was, she wanted to look good. And I was yeah, they really got to have their pearls and the... Yes, and the hair and everything. Mm -hmm. When I walked into that wake, she looked better than I had ever seen her look in my life. And so she, because they have humor, she was being a jokester on the other side and she was cracking up because it was like, she got me thinking, she was keeping the, the, the expectations low. She was a Capricorn. <laughs> yeah, then, it's like insulting when, your own food or something like, oh, I know it's gonna need salt. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> when I showed up, she looked I've never seen 
anyone look that beautiful in a casket in my entire life so like they have humor man and they're they're always there with us yeah again i don't know where we got from where we got so sorry here he knows <laughs> Oh, I think she just, I think she just gave you a sidebar though. Your grandma, she just came in. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, she just oh. gave a sidebar because you were talking about, oh. Oh, see, that's what happens when I connect to medium land. I do uh -huh. sort of, I don't know if it's dissociate or lose track of whatever, because I, it's just a habit. I just go bing and then like I'm receptive. So I don't. Had you ever been accused when you were younger of being like, like you're airheaded? Like, totally. like you're Okay. Yeah. Seven forty-seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They would. What my even my astral ast astrology friend would tell me because I'm double Gemini Virgo Moon. She'd be like, "Oh, you're just an airhead." I'm like, "Well, oh my I God!" In more ways than one, because here we are, air <laughs> signs, and we're airhead. Oh, oh my God! And, and don't get me started. That. When Mercury's in retrograde, I am kaputs because my Mercury's in Gemini my and gemini and virgo are ruled in mercury and i have like two other mercury things going on oh, so like and we're mercury in the middle of mercury retrograde right now i had to cancel like three readings because i was like oh yeah i can't even fathom doing anything i remember one time i was in the the living room and i was reading someone and um this was more um i don't think they were a paid client they were sort of a friend we were sort of bartering and stuff and i was like sis I see your father, he's on the couch, but he's not talking to me. And I'm like, this doesn't happen. And I'm like, what day is it? Where are we? Is it a full moon? And I checked and it was Mercury retrograde. And so I tried and I tried and I tried, but I was like, this isn't happening. So I just canceled, uh, you know, three or three of my readings those next few days. And, but I got back on the swing of things. So I'm okay now. <laughs> ah, it's okay to take time. You know, we just need to take time. I don't make jewelry when I don't feel fully 100%. I don't touch it. Good. I don't touch it. Just... Oh, honey bear, I still have your beautiful sage that I burned I... today. That's interesting. You still got it. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, you don't burn sage much. Well, I, I, break, it, I break it open like weed and just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't smoke weed, so I might as well have fun with sage. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, this would be funny, actually. I was like... <laughs> yeah. Lord and I mercy. pour oil on it. I saw somebody put an essential oil on it. I was like, I'm gonna do that. I like that. So I break it open and um like I have this bowl. Yeah. Beautiful. With birds on it. And then I break it open, pour some essential oil in there and burn it. I have a good time. I'm probably, I don't know, I might be high from sage because sometimes it makes your lips tingle a little bit. <laughs> I got you. I have fun. I have fun. I got the bird. The birds are outside. They were all ganging me. That's why I had to go off camera. I'm like, okay, they they might poop on my porch if I don't come out there with some food. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and this so was wonderful, Daniel. I'm hoping we get to see each other again soon. Absolutely. Yeah. I know we just need to have a retreat where it's just us having a retreat where we're just hanging out. Like, like everything doesn't have to be like this big purpose or a big mm. talk a party. <laughs> yeah, just like, like, hey, let's just rent a house in a cabin and just <sighs> hang out, you know, like not for a purpose of a seminar, but just. I know people. You know. I know yeah. people living in a beautiful cabin in the woods, wonderful couple who actually met us in I think it was Florida or one of the other things that we did and they're always like anytime you and your friends want to come on up and I'm in Orlando and I just realized Matthew was down in Tampa yes that's right and I'm North Carolina so we could do a whole east coast thing Terry where are you here too. I'm in Winnipeg and in Central wants Canada. To come down here. and Sherry Debavan she's on the other side she's not in Tampa she's on the other side and Mark Saba says in North Carolina, there's a uh, Christina Dobbs, Lee Dobbs or whatever, beautiful uh -huh. orchestra. All them we are- get the big quick girl to come. Who's that, Jessica? Yeah, Jessica Jones. I just like saying Jessica Jones a lot. I like saying that name because it's a Marvel character. So it's just so funny. Like, are you, they turned your whole name into a TV show. <laughs> it's funny for the longest time, my first girlfriends, um, 
they had very characterish names mm -hmm. and even my friends were like sure they're your girlfriend sure but it was very character names like they'd have you know similar similar letters and stuff but it was it was true <laughs> yeah. they're larger than life larger than life yeah we do need to we need to talk you know i think um Here's kind of a thing that probably happens with spiritual people. They always feel like they have to be on a mission all the time or that they're well, always having yeah. to be, uh, what is that? Like on some type of hero's journey. I got to get this crystal. I got to go to this conference. I got to do this reading and I got to, and, and it's like, yeah, let's have some fun. You know, I, I felt that for myself um, just because I'm very, I'm just naturally kind of like, I guess you can call it mission oriented. I've just always yeah, been Yeah, me too, me too, yeah. But there def definitely needs to come a time when you do have to let go. But man, like if you feel as though you're A, not really from here very often, and also two, you recognize how short and precious life is, even given dying a few times in a lifetime, you're like, mama's got work to do. You know, like, what do we got to do? Let's take care of this. But you're right though. We have to also just let go sometimes and just yeah because we're always just planning on i'm going to this conference and you're either going to sell talk or learn yeah. sell talk or learn and it's like okay well how about we just go fuck off really and yeah. just <laughs> I mean, at the, at the Journey to Truth conference, which was great, I didn't see any speaker at all. I just gave readings and I sold books and I was very, boom, re regimented. This is, this is how I was. But Did you realize that you could watch it on your phone? I was too busy, honey. I, I was oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were amazing. This was another thing that I had was thinking because of the way I honestly think that whole time with the cancer, like allows you to find quiet and chaos. Ooh. And to pull yourself away from everything because of for a man to sit there and teach piano lessons. And I'm just running through the thing. I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't know you were on camera. <laughs> He's totally giving a lesson. He's in a whole nother world. And I'm like, with all going around and he's just still like <laughs> but i had i had charlie there too and i couldn't leave him like i just i had to go to work you know oh God. yeah he was just doing it and i was like you are totally a special kind of person to be able to pull into this mm -hmm. and yeah. well you know in the in the mind body spirit whatever you call them conferences and things like that you are in a in a convention center with like a bajillion people with all of their auras and egos and stuff and so you only have a certain amount of time with your your client it's usually 15 30 minutes sometimes they do longer um but yeah you have to just boom narrow focus and then also too it is kind of weird to be communicating with like dead people and then psychic land and then like guides and then real people and it's just and then people come by and they're like oh that's dan hi dan and it's so insane but hey yeah it's well, all good here guys just <laughs> yeah like this is the 15 minutes is up okay we're not taking any more messages from me like do you ever have to like hey the time is up we're done <laughs> no more messages <laughs> Done. I mean, I I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I if if I had the bags under my eyes, but the past four or five days, I don't know why, I've gotten maybe an average of two to three hours, maybe each night of sleep. Just, yeah, I'm like, I, I've around. had I've had similar, and I never have trouble. But man, the last few days have been, I think, intense intense um, solar activity. Maybe. Yeah. Well, it was great. I think um, I keep trying to tell people, come down here, let's go to Universal or something. And people are looking at me like, okay, yeah, bye. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm stop the recording now because we had a great time. Yeah. And that just feels like we should live together. That's what it feels like. <laughs> like, <laughs> like at the conference, that's how I felt like, dang, like she's gonna go here, you're gonna go here. Like, could you imagine if me, you, Matt,